Thank you, Sharon. We move now to the prophet Isaiah, page 595 in the Old Testament section. Isaiah opens with prophetic statements and then he goes back to tell the story of his call. Now, scholars tell us that there's at least two, maybe three authors of the book as we have it today. There's historic Isaiah, usually Isaiah 1 through 40, second Isaiah, which is Isaiah 40 to 60, and maybe a third Isaiah who was in the exile who made more comments at the tail end of the book. This is historic Isaiah. This is Jerusalem is under threat, but not yet under siege. Jeremiah is the one who gets stuck with the, church, with the city under siege. We think Isaiah had a reason to be in the temple. And one of the things that's different about the temple versus church is you're not welcome to come inside. Everybody wants you to come to church. They want you to come look at the temple but not go inside because that's where the holy people go. You are not welcome. And it's degrees. Everybody can be on the far outside in the court of the Gentiles. Men and women, Jews and non-Jews. The next group gets rid of the women and the Gentiles instantly and it's nothing but Jewish men. And then finally you get down, well, nothing but Jews. And then you get down to Jewish men in the final court. So Jewish women can be in the middle. Yet what happens is, is the temple is wide open through a series of doors and gates all the way through so that you can see clear inside the temple and see the curtain in front of the Holy of Holies, as well as the altar, which is out front, where the giant barbecue is always going on. What happens on that altar is that everything from grain offerings, oil offerings, pigeons, and full bullocks are parts of them burned on that altar in front of the temple. There's also an incense altar, and it may well be that one which is referred to in what's coming next. King Uzziah marks this as a point in Israel's history, the southern kingdom of Judah. And we pick up now with Isaiah. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs, that's a special kind of angel, were in attendance above him. They're the ones that are according to legend, gathered around God. Each had six wings. With two they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The pivots, that's the hinges for the big doors on the threshold, shook at the voices of those who called and the house, the temple, filled with smoke. And I said, woe is me, I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphs flew to me holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraph touched my mouth with it and said, now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed and your sin is blotted out. <coughs> then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who for, will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. Have you ever been to really big cathedrals? I mean, I hate to tell you, they have very little in common with how I live my life. 
I think they're wonderful and awe-inspiring, but I kind of get why they have a small group. Well, for one thing, traditionally, they don't have any chairs. Well, that's a little hard, you know. In the Orthodox Church, in the medieval church, everybody stood up all the way for church. Uh, I notice nowadays most European cathedrals that actually have, people in them have chairs. But they do pick them up and move them around. Um, they are huge. They are awe-inspiring. And I think some of us always wish that we could have that kind of experience of God high and echoey and lifted up and awe-inspiring and for some of us that's happened in the mountains for some of us it's happened on the sea especially if you're out there in the waves instead of safely on the shore for some of us it happens as you look down from the airplane and see how small the world can be for others it's hearing great music that as all good music says more than words it has a meaning and a structure of its own that carries us away. So it is that one kind of vision of God is this high and lifted up majestic vision of who God is. And that vision has been sort of shortened down in this present day. Uh, I'm a little uncomfortable with Jesus as my buddy because Jesus is the one who tells us about God. And if Isaiah is right, and if this teaching about God the Creator is right, God is holy, God is strength, God is power, and God is God. There's also a saving moment in this vision, and I don't know about you, but it, I find it a little scary and yet very powerfully cleansing. Have you ever really wished you could have spit out of your mouth something you said and got rid of it? But you've already said it and once it's been said it can't be unsaid? Isaiah is very aware that he is not the Holy One and the Holy One is there in the temple with him. Whether he served as a priest or a Levite, he looked up and he was struck down. And then a live coal in a pair of tongs came and touched his lips. Now, I don't know about you, but I think I'd be afraid. I have eaten many a charred steak, but I don't think I've ever actually grabbed the coals intentionally in my life. But I have burned myself. And this is an image of a sinful person with a holy God feeling, wanting to be free, wanting to be full of that power and joy that they see in the Lord and yet scared to death. And then comes this burning coal and phew, all your sin is burned away. It's an image not many of us relate to in our small town churches. We don't have high and holy cathedrals. I've been to the National Cathedral, and I mean, you could play football inside that thing. I'm not too sure somebody hasn't, one of the janitorial staff. I've been to the Episcopal Cathedral in St. Louis, and it's classically Gothic, and it's not even old. And I've been to St. Cecilia's Basilica Cathedral in Omaha, which sounds kind of small, and Omaha's not a big town, but it's huge. And it's set up for roaring, echoing, solemn music. But I don't live my life in those places. And I think those who do sometimes get calloused by it, you know. Sometimes I think the ministers in those places Begin to kind of end up being like the janitors, you know. Well, let's get this done and scrubbed up and get on to the next thing. The problem with high and holy is it's far away. 
And in Isaiah's case, it came down. But it doesn't happen real often for us. And we go looking for those places and praying for those moments. But like Isaiah, we may be a little scared when they actually happen. Nicodemus comes to Jesus in a different kind of vision. Nicodemus comes as a Pharisee who's on the Sanhedrin, which means he's already a part of the party that's not in charge of the temple. That's the Sadducees. Nicodemus should be Jesus' ally. Nicodemus, Joseph of Arimathea, we think, both became allies for Jesus who were outvoted when he was crucified. But here, at the very first, we have Nicodemus trying to spec out Jesus, and like any good politician, he doesn't want it recorded. So he comes by night. Now, I don't know about you, but that would mean something like a U.S. Senator or House of Representatives member sneaking down an alleyway in D.C. to try not to be seen. Uh, you can do it, but it takes work. But he got there. And the vision that Jesus lays before him is not one of gradual change, not one of let's take over the Sanhedrin and try to cleanse the temple, although Jesus comes to cleanse the temple, but that is an act of symbolic judgment. Instead, Jesus says, you know, you gotta start over. And the good news is, you can. But the vision is in this room, close up, Jesus says, you have to be born not just the regular way, not just born by the waters of birth, but you have to be born by the Spirit. Now, church types, preachers especially from the second and third century on, say born by water and the Spirit means first you have to be baptized, and then you have to be confirmed. You know, first we give you the water, then we give you the holy oil and the gift of the Spirit. And if we baptize adults, Many of us still take oil and make the sign of the cross on the person's forehead as it alluded to in our hymn, Lift High the Cross. That it takes more than water. It takes more than natural life. It takes an encounter with the Spirit that lets us start over. And on this Trinity Sunday, it's not... You know how they have those nifty little triangles all the time and the triangles with the curvy parts and all that that they want to use to show the Trinity? <sighs> These scriptures are kind of lopsided. This is Jesus talking about God's spirit and Isaiah talking about the creator. But the vision for Nicodemus is here right now. Let the wind of God blow through you and start over. Let's start over and let's start over clean i think we can pick up that image of having our sins burned away from isaiah but what is happening now is our sins are washed away no because this is talking about natural birth versus spirit birth our spirit birth blows away our sin and lets us start over now it's a little trendy in the past. How many of you have ever been in a situation where you really said, I need a do-over? And in some communities, that's okay. And in others, it's not. In some churches, it's okay to say, I was wrong, I screwed up, and can we start over, and it's okay. And in other churches, and I grew up in one of them, it's called, so why did you do it in the first place? Instead of grace and forgiveness, I got a dose of, so how did you end up in this situation? Or if you want to quote Prairie Home Companion, Father Amel at our Church of Our Lady of Perpetual Responsibility, says, if you didn't want to go to Minneapolis, why did you get on the train? I know how I got into this mess eventually. Maybe I didn't see it coming, but I was in it, and now I'm in the middle of the swamp, 
and the alligators are coming and I would like some help, please. And what I used to get as a child was a critique of how I got into the swamp in the first place. I don't need that from God. I don't need that from my church. What I need instead from Jesus Christ is word that do-overs are not only possible, they're normal. You are born into this life by water, by the physical birth. But what starts your life over again when you need to start over, and we all need to start over. Anybody here not ever screwed up? <laughs> Made it to age 80, never did a thing wrong? I had relatives who really thought that. I had a member of my first church. He says, you know, I used to mess up when I was in my 50s, but now that I'm in my 70s and 80s, I really think I'm getting better every week. And he was in a little Sunday school class with two of his brothers. Now the whole church was 25 people. So the men's Sunday school class was three. The women's Sunday school class was four. The children's class was four, you know, sometimes one. And the two brothers looked at him and said, oh yeah, we know you. Well, he says, well, I think I'm probably getting ready to go to heaven. They said, good, we'll send you there. <laughs> They do better. So does God. Don't con yourself. We all need to repent. We're all making mistakes all the time. Sometimes with bigger consequences, sometimes with smaller ones, but that's who we are. As our earlier prayer said, we're not God, we're human beings. We mess up. So what's the solution? Well, you can spend your life in regret and remorse and wish you'd never done it in the first place, which is basically akin to, I haven't really repented of the sin that I did with her. I'm just repenting that we got caught. <laughs> That's not repentance. Repentance is I shouldn't have looked at that woman in the first place. Again, I shouldn't have got on the train. Gee, I was surprised I got to Minneapolis. Yeah, you have to face the fact that we all need do-overs. All of us, all the time. And that it's not just the power of human forgiveness, although that's important. And sometimes people are so mad at us, they won't give it to us. What we did was so bad that they're not about to forgive. What do you do in that case? You can't just make it right on a human level. Well, one of the things is Jesus says you can be born by the Spirit of God. And it's a very simple process. You say, Lord, I was wrong. And you say it at the start of your Christian life and you keep saying it the rest of your Christian life. Lord, I was wrong. Please forgive me. Make me right with you and show me how to make it right with others. That's the goal. So that instead of being little bulldozers that shove all the hurts of our life ahead of us with our blade and the pile just gets bigger and bigger and finally we have to start backing the bulldozer up and push from a couple different directions to keep all of our sins and wrongs and errors and hurts Instead of being bulldozers, we're soil movers. Have you seen those big ones that have an engine on the front and the back and they scoop up the whole pile of dirt and carry it away? That's what happens to our problems and our sins and the wrongs we have done to others. The image in scripture is, and a great wind of the Holy Spirit comes through and blows through your life and all that stuff is gone. You ever stood on a cliff in a strong trade wind? And maybe you were hanging on to a brochure and suddenly the brochure became a glider and we don't know how many miles down the road it landed, right? The wind of the spirit is a cleansing power. Jesus says, and God sent me not to judge you, 
but that you might find life. Not to judge others, but that they might find life. I think it's important to have this highly and holy view of who God is. God is that one. But it's also more important, I think, to remember that Jesus is there looking Nicodemus in the eye and saying, you can start over with the Spirit's help. You need to be born not just in a physical way, but you need to be born as a new person through the Spirit. And you need to come back and do it again and again and again. I used to hear that old gospel song, Revive us again. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again and again and again. And I thought, you know, we have a revival every year and nobody gets any better. <laughs> well, the good news is, as my mom used to say, well, you know, think about those people if they weren't Christians. Think how much worse they would be. Think if they were turned loose on a world with no controls. I don't think it's bad news anymore. I think it's just who we are. We are people that need to be forgiven and healed and start over. And we are people that need to go to others and do the same thing. Start over with them. And build those relationships back. The only way to conquer the wrong in this world is not by standing on our two feet and proclaiming how righteous we are, but instead by through the Spirit going out and living out that life of forgiveness that we know and that we can share with other people. Those are the visions. I think the vision of Jesus says the Spirit is just like the wind. Feel the wind right now? Feel the trades? What if it stopped? Wouldn't you all go outside and look for a breeze? This is the wind of the Spirit's example. This is the refreshing wind that blows the dirt away. This is the wind of the Spirit that heals.